Do you consider yourself a connoisseur in underground indie games? Do you believe in a correlation between participation in things that no one has heard of and social capital? Are you blissfully unaware of the fact that Don't Starve and Terraria are actually fairly well heard of and aren't the underground titles they once were? And finally, do you cream your pants a little bit every single time you see something in a pixelated style? If you answered yes to any of these, then this, my friend, is the crossover for you. An interdimensional crack between the two games, usually called a marketing deal, has opened, spilling forth audio compression artifacts, lore written within the span of an hour, and eyeballs into the world of Don't Starve, and endless comparisons to Tim Burton, alongside suicidal thoughts, colonialism, and beard clippings into the world of Terraria. Each game has now been invaded with a small selection of content from the opposite game, interpreted to properly fit its new game environment. This video will go over the additions from both games, starting with Don't Starve, because that's probably what most people actually only care about. Before we start the video, however, I am going to be doing a giveaway of some Steam keys for Don't Starve Together itself and Terraria. Yes, this is real, there are genuine game keys that exist and will be given away. A very big thanks to Clay for providing their ambassadors with these keys. If you want to enter for any of these giveaways, leave a comment on the video. This is how I'll be generating winners for the giveaway. If you're entering, please include the following phrases, displayed on screen, relevant to whatever you'd like to enter for. Please do not enter for multiple categories, if you do this I am liable to skip over your vote. I want everyone to have a fair shot and don't want to give multiple rewards to one person. I know that this is sort of a pain, so I'm sorry about that, but this is the best way for me to see who's entering for what specifically. About a week after this video comes out, I'll release a community post and will notify all the winners using YouTube's ping system. From there we can work out contact. I'm happy to contact you using Discord, email, whatever works. Thanks for entering and good luck. Now back to the video. Don't Starve side of the crossover begins with a new item called the Terrarium, which can be found inside a special chest found anywhere in the world. The chest contains a small number of supplies to aid you in surviving alongside the Terrarium itself. A little bit of a side note here, but I really like the way the Terrarium's chest is implemented. It definitely brings me back to the days when finding Chester's eye bone was the most exciting thing ever. The chest appearing randomly in the world makes early day exploration just that little bit more exciting. It's one more thing to look out for that isn't more or less the same between worlds. Placing the terrarium on the ground and then right-clicking it during night time will summon the Eye of Terror. This boss is, obviously, an adaptation of the Eye of Cthulhu boss from Terraria, likely renamed because no one at Clay could figure out how to spell Cthulhu. Seriously, what is up with that? Silly Lovecraft, why couldn't your creation simply speak English, just like every other sci-fi race out there? The Eye will attempt to ram the player and will occasionally stop to summon minions. Destroying the eggs before they hatch will prevent this. Once it loses about a third of its health, it'll transition to its second phase, gaining a mouth and charging at the player much more often, leaving a smaller window for it to be attacked. The Eye of Terror only has 5,000 health, but similarly to Interaria, it must be killed before nighttime ends, otherwise it leaves, which makes it slightly more difficult to kill than a seasonal boss, although it can be resummoned the next night, which will continue the fight right where it left off. All in all, it's not too hard to deal with if you have a decent weapon, some armor, and experience killing bosses. Fighting it in winter is also much easier because of the extended nighttime. If you're playing with multiple people, Autumn and Spring will also be fine, because of your greatly increased damage output. Upon death, the eye drops a number of monster meat, some milky whites, and an eye mask. Milky whites count as a dairy item in the crockpot, and although this sounds quite minor, keep in mind that every other dairy item in the game is a major hassle to get your hands on, requiring you to either electrify a goat and then kill it, or get lucky killing butterflies. This makes ice cream in the milkmaid hat much easier to make. Keep in mind that fresh fruit crepes, waffles, and wobs of dinner all require butter specifically, which means that whites are only useful for the first two aforementioned recipes. Overall, milky whites get a 0 out of 10 because you can't prepare them for consumption on toast. Speaking of recipes, this update also adds two new cookable dishes. Number one is the frozen banana daiquiri, requiring one cave banana and one ice. This dish is essentially a better banana popsicle, having the same requirements minus the stick. Health is generally more preferable than sanity, so unless you desperately need to be not insane, there isn't really much reason to actually make popsicles anymore. The second dish is called the rabbit stew, made with one morsel and two ice plus one filler. It's a bit of a random addition to the game, having virtually nothing to do with the rest of the update, but as it does restore 20 health, it can make for an okay way to restore health at a pinch. It also removes one possible way to make meatballs, however you can still use monster meat in combination with ice to make them, so this doesn't actually have much of an impact. The eye mask 
mask, unlike in Terraria where it's exclusively a vanity item, functions as a football helmet with a unique twist. It can be fed any food in order to restore its durability. This makes it actually quite a potent boss drop, considering the difficulty level of the Eye of Terror. Having to farm pigskin constantly in the mid and late game just so I can have headslot armor is a gigantic pain, and this boss item will seriously alleviate a lot of that work. Personally, I wouldn't use this item in a raid boss fight just because I'd be too afraid of it going to 0% and breaking forever, so situations like those is probably where I'm going to dump all my newly acquired excess pigskin. However, that's not everything I related this update adds. Finding the regular Eye of Terror too easy, enjoy pain and suffering, then by using some nightmare fuel on the terrarium while it's not recharging, you can corrupt it. Repeat the same method as described earlier with this corrupted terrarium to summon the Twins of Terror. The fact that you had to right click the terrarium with nightmare fuel is in fact a clever reference to terraria, because in that game, many bosses are summoned and items are obtained using extremely obtuse methods that are nearly impossible to figure out using simple intuition. Once the twins are summoned, they'll both act independently, charging the player and summoning minions. Once either of them reaches low health, they will both enter the hellish second phase, which is the same as the first except they charge and minion spam even more than before. What joy. Killing these two assholes solo is a major pain, since they give you barely any time to attack in between their constant movements, especially in the second phase. It's recommended to either bring some friends, or cheese them by bringing them to another raid boss such as the Dragonfly or better yet Klaus, who will quickly become enraged Klaus. This can also be used to cheese other bosses and not just the twins, as they are extremely strong. Upon death, the twins drop a number of gears, nightmare fuel, electrical doodads, frazzled wires, and a green gem and a yellow gem. The final twin to die will also drop the Shield of Terror, which is essentially a refillable tentacle spike damage-wise. It also gives armor protection, making it the first handheld item in the game to give armor value. While the shield is fairly interesting, I don't think it's really a good enough reward as is for defeating such a difficult boss as the twins, especially when you consider how good the eye mask can be in comparison to the regular eye's difficulty. That being said, it may receive a tweak in the future, so don't dismiss it just yet. This update also includes two well generation presets for Don't Stop Together. These presets are not required to access the new content, and to be honest, I don't really understand why they exist. The changes that apply to the world are up on screen. No shadow creatures means that obtaining nightmare fuel will be difficult, requiring you to go to the ruins to fight nightmare creatures instead. And spring start means I have to prepare for the more difficult summer instead of winter, as well as deal with constant wetness. The other changes aren't really very notable and are mostly just annoying. I don't really understand the intended appeal behind this preset. Even if you're a new player, it won't help teach you the game or make it easier to access certain content, although the extended night times will make fighting the new bosses a bit more doable. Finally, the update introduces a number of Terraria-themed skins. I was pleasantly surprised by these. They honestly look quite nice, merging the two styles together quite well. The only thing I dislike about them is the pixelated effects that some of them have. This effect is also shared by some new items. It also appears in the trailer and the main menu. Like, I get it. Terraria has a pixel style. I don't need to be reminded of that by an on-the-nose pixelated fart cloud appearing every time I use my Knight's Edge Dark Sword. Pixel art is a key feature of the graphic this is a friendly reminder to follow me on Twitter. I post about nothing once in a blue moon. If you like posting about nothing once in a blue moon, consider joining my Discord server too. There's a lot of nothing once in a blue moon there as well. Speaking of pixels, it's time to introduce the second side of the update. The Terraria part of the crossover adds quite a number of things. Number one is the Deerclops boss, who is stormed over to the world of Terraria. The boss can either be summoned using the Deer Thing, which is crafted with Flinx Fur, some of your world's evil ore, and a lens at an evil altar. Additionally, it can also appear during a blizzard if you're in a snow biome at midnight. It's recommended to fight the Deerclops after you've cleared the dungeon, because this is when you'll have the most appropriate gear. Having a hook and boots will come in handy, as will setting up a platform arena to dodge its attacks. The Deerclops has a number of ice-themed moves. If the player is somewhat close, it'll summon a wave of ice spikes that travel along the ground towards the player, twice, and then doing a shorter range ice spike attack that travels in both directions. You can probably already see why platforms are so strongly recommended. Should you stay outside its melee range, Deerclops will become enveloped in shadows, unable to be targeted. This requires you to stay close in order to damage it. If the player is outside the ice spike range, it can also throw a number of ice projectiles that fall back down. These can pass through blocks. Deerclops can also roar, which will unavoidably inflict the slow debuff at range. In expert mode, the clops can also summon shadow hands, performing various attacks. Should the player spend too much time above the boss, it will also do this regardless of the difficulty. Once the Deerclops is killed, it has a number of Don't Starve themed items it can drop. It has a 33% chance to drop either an eye bone, an umbrella, or a radio thing. The eye bone is a pet item that summons Chester. Similar to Don't Starve, he can be opened and used as a portable piggy bank. This actually makes him the most useful pet in the game, if that wasn't already obviously the case from his mere existence. The umbrella is a vanity hat that causes a little rain cloud to appear over the player. How whimsical. The radio thing when put in a vanity slot will give the world a sapia shader, reminiscent of the color cube effects used in Don't Starve. The same effect is used in the constant world generation secret seed. More on that later. 
using the radio thing in this secret seed will remove the special effects instead. The Deacops will also drop one of four Don't Starve weapons or tools. The first of these is Wheeler's Pumatic Horn. This ranged weapon consumes ammo like normal, but instead fires one of a variety of projectiles, each one having its own associated damage value. Unlike the Pumatic and Don't Starve, it does not require or consume these items, instead it just uses regular bullets. The second is the Weather Pain, being a magic weapon that summons a single tornado homing in on enemies and dealing magic damage. Since only one can be summoned at once, you should bring a second magic weapon to swap out to. Pretty self-explanatory. The third is the Houndius Chudius Stuff, summoning a stationary HS turret which shoots at enemies. Also, pretty self-explanatory. Lucy the Axe is Deerclops' final drop. It's an extremely powerful axe, with the third highest axe power in the entire game, which makes it useful even throughout much of hard mode. The main drawback of this item is the fact that it cannot be used as a hammer or pickaxe, like many other axe items in Terraria, so you're essentially sacrificing a hotbar or inventory slot for some extra axe power, at least until you get a more powerful alternative. Oh, and did I mention the fact that Lucy never shuts up, ever? It goes without saying that Lucy's true drawback is the loss of your sanity in real life. Finally, in expert mode, Deerclops also drops the Bone Helm, which causes Shadow Hands to attack nearby enemies passively. Pretty neat. Next up, there are also a number of weapons from Don't Starve that don't drop from Deerclops. The iconic Hand Bat is dropped from Pigrons with a rare chance. Like all Don't Starve themed items, this chance is increased on the special Constant Seed. The Hand Bat is pretty straightforward, dealing 50 damage with good speed. However, if the player is to consume any food items, its damage will actually increase depending on the specific food buff acquired. Abigail's Flower is a summon item that can randomly be found growing near a placed gravestone. The chance for this to happen is increased in the special seed. Unlike other summons in Terraria, using the item multiple times will not summon multiple Abigails, but will instead increase the power of the initial one, each taking up a summon slot. The Bat Bat is a bat made of bat, dropped by batting any bat creature to death, preferably using a bat. Similarly to Don't Starve, it'll occasionally heal the player for 5 HP. A somewhat reliable healing source, but probably not very good as a main melee damage dealer. Finally, the Tentacle Spike is dropped by any evil dwelling mob in pre-hard mode. It... it hits things doesn't really do anything special. It can be decent if you find it super early on, but you have to get quite lucky for that to happen due to its low drop chance. The Magiluminescence is also a piece of equipment that can be crafted with 5 topaz and 12 of your world's respective evil bars. It increases your movement speed and emits light. The speed bonus actually stacks with Hermes boots, which makes it a choice accessory for any speed freaks out there. The update also includes some small extras, such as Bernie, a Pigman, a Glomer, the aforementioned Chester, and a tiny Deerclops, all obtainable in pet form from various sources. There are also Willow and Wilson themed vanity sets, a craftable vanity garland, Froggle Bunwich and Monster Lasagna as consumable foods, and four Don't Starve themed paintings, originally by Chill Ju Lee. Finally, the Terraria side of the update adds a special seed to Terraria, which will add a number of Don't Starve themed changes, in addition to making every Don't Starve themed item more common. Firstly, it adds some special Don't Starve themed shaders and lighting, giving the game a distinct sapia tone. Standing in complete darkness is now dangerous, watch out for Charlie. In addition, Brain can put out unsheltered torches and campfires. Terraria will need to regularly eat foods, otherwise they'll deal decreased damage and will eventually starve to death. Food is any item that gives a well-fed buff upon consumption, which means that some items such as mushrooms do not count. Most caught critters can be made into a food item, as well as most fish. Monster lasagna, one of the new additions, can also be easily made using 8 rotten chunk or 8 vertebra, which is quite accessible once you can comfortably kill mobs in the evil biomes. And finally, a small number of world gen changes are applied, such as small marble and spider biomes appearing on the surface, meant to mimic the chest biomes in spider dens respectively. And that's everything added in the Don't Starve Together x Terraria crossover from both games. Overall, I quite like the material added to both games. In Don't Starve, it's extremely nice to have a way to somewhat easily get a refuelable football helmet. The eye mask is quickly becoming one of my favourite items in the entire game. The boss fight is also quite fun despite its simplicity, although the Twins of Terror are frankly quite awful to fight, and simply aren't that fun. Even with more than one person, the sheer amount of charging and minion vomiting is a gigantic pain. To be fair, this is likely done to pay tribute to the way that Terraria's bosses create difficulty by spamming projectiles and minions. So at least this update tries to stay true to its source material. Jokes aside, it is a bit weird that Retinizer and Spasmatism don't use their signature lasers and flamethrowers, instead just increasing the intensity of their normal attacks in the second phase. In my humblest of opinions, this fight could probably do with the rework to make it less awful, and a more faithful recreation of the original boss. As for the Terraria side of things, I'm probably not the best person to judge Terraria content, but I do definitely enjoy the new additions. The Don't Starve Seed is fun to play around with, 
the hunger meter and Charlie's presence are fun little things to shake up the main gameplay loop a bit. It's also nice to see some more early game summoner gear, even if it's just a little bit. I can see Abigail becoming a mainstay of summoners early on, she definitely seems kind of worth it. And finally, the choices of bosses and items to add to each game are extremely appropriate. Deerclops is just too iconic to pass up, and the Eye of Cthulhu is appropriate for the same reason, but also because it's a thematic fit for Don't Starve as well. This is how game crossovers should be done. To be honest, the two games work very well in tandem, and most of the new content is non-intrusive in either game. That's all for now, thanks for watching, and I'll see you around.